The Sign of the Beaver by Elizabeth George Spear, Chapter 19. Grandmother say you come to village today, Atien announced two days later. That's kind of her, Matt answered, but my hand is just about healed. It doesn't need any more medicine. Not for medicine, Matt waited uncertainly. My grandmother, very surprised, white boy, go long way for Indian dog, Atien explained. She say you welcome. So once again, Matt crossed the river into the Indian stockade. This time, though the dogs barked at him and children stared and giggled, he did not feel so much like a stranger. Sockneys held out a hand of welcome. Atien's grandmother did not exactly smile, but her thin lips were less grim. Beside her, Atien's sister smiled, but did not speak. The old woman dipped a clamshell ladle into a kettle and filled three bowls with a stew of fish and corn, then drew back while Atien and Saknis and Matt ate their meal in silence. Neither she nor Marie ate till the men were finished. After the meal, Atien did not hurry him away. He rather grandly played host and led Matt about the village. He was amused when Matt kept stopping every few feet to watch what the women were doing. Matt was filled with curiosity. He knew well enough that Atien was scornful of the squaw work the white boy had to do, but Atien didn't have to worry about what he was going to eat next day. Oops, I'm sorry. But Atien, did, okay, okay, that's right. There were so many things Matt wanted to learn. He observed carefully as two women pounded dried kernels of corn between two rounded stones, catching the coarse flour on a strip of birch bark. He marked how they spread berries on the bark so that the sun dried them hard as pebbles. He admired the baskets made of a single strip of birch bark, bent and fastened at the corners so tightly that water could be boiled inside. I remember that. I must remember that, he resolved. I could do that myself if I tried. For a time, Atien good-naturedly answered his questions. Finally, he grew impatient of squaw work. He led Matt toward a cluster of boys who squatted in a circle in the dirt pathway, absorbed in some noisy game. The boys widened their ring to make room for two more, and Matt crouched awkwardly on his heels to watch them. One after another, one after the other, they were shaking six smooth bone discs in a wooden bowl and tossing them out onto the ground. Each disc was marked on one side with a band of red paint. When each boy had had a turn, the one who had thrown the most discs to land painted side up was proclaimed the winner and with and with much gloating, he collected from each of the others a number of small sticks. Then they handed the bowl to Matt. His luck was good. Five of the discs showed red bands, and with laughter and clowning, the others piled up before him a little heap of sticks. What was so exciting about the simple game, he wondered, to cause so much shouting? The bowl went rapidly around the circle, and sticks kept changing hands, and presently he had the answer. One of the boys had no sticks left to pay. With a mocking groan, he unclasped from his arm a wide copper band and tossed it to the winner. So that's it, Matt thought silently. Sooner or later, I'm bound to lose two, and when I do, what will they expect me to forfeit? <laughs> he did not have long to wait. At his next turn, every one of the discs landed blank side up, ruefully, he handed over the last of his sticks he had won. There was a gleeful shout, and then they waited. What do I have? Hmm, he thought desperately. Nothing in his pocket but a jackknife, and his very life depended upon that knife. Then the boy nearest him reached over and jerked roughly at the sleeve of his shirt. Matt pretended not to understand, and the boy tugged harder. Two of the others got to their feet, plainly ready to tear the shirt from his back. Atien made no move to help him. Grimly, he pulled the shirt over his head and tossed it to the winner. It served him right, he supposed. My father, his father, had always forbidden him to gamble. 
But what was going to do? What was he going to do without his without that shirt? It was the only one he had. Now Etienne put an end to the game. He leaped up to his feet, produced from nowhere a soft ball made of deerskin. Instantly, the others raced off in all directions and came back carrying thin sticks. One of these was thrust at Matt. It was a curious sort of bat, light and flexible with a wide, flat curve at the tip. Forgetting his humiliation, Matt suddenly grinned. With a bat in his hand, he could hold his own with any Indian. The boys back in Quincy could have told them that. Eagerly, he joined in the scramble of choosing sides, but never had he played a game like this, so fast and merciless. The ball could not be touched by hand or foot. It was kept flying through the air by the sticks alone. If it fell to the ground, some player scooped it up with the trip of his bat and then sent it spinning again. The Indian boys were bewilderingly quick and skillful, skillful and they yielded and they wielded their bats with no heed for each other's heads and certainly not for Matt's. It was no accident, he knew, when his elbow jabbed suddenly into his, when an elbow jabbed suddenly into his right eye. These boys were putting him to the test. Ignoring the blows that fell on his head and shoulders, Matt swung grimly at the whirling ball, missing it over and over, but sometimes feeling the satisfying, the satisfying whack, thwack that is, of bat against leather. He was thankful now that he had no shirt. If only he could be wearing a breech cloth, cloth instead of tight English breeches. But there was no time for worrying about his clothes. Finally, by pure luck, he sent the ball into the hole in the ground that marked the goal. Out of breath and dripping, he grinned. He grinned as his side generously cheered, as his side generously cheered him on and whacked his sore shoulders. Then, with a whoop, they raced all together through the stockade gate down to the river and went leaping like frogs into the water. Matt floated face down, gratefully, grateful for the coolness against his burning cheeks. All at once, a brown arm circled his neck and dragged him under. Squirming free, he seized a black head in both hands, and the two boys went down together. They came up gasping and grinning. Suddenly, Matt was enjoying himself. It was almost as good as being back in Quincy again. The sun had reached the top of the pines when, when he and the Atian, when he went to Atian's cabin to bid the grandmother goodbye. She stood studying him, and he flushed under his sharp eyes. He must look a sight, he knew. There was a lump as big as an egg on his forehead, and his right eye was probably turning black. She turned and spoke a few stern words to Etienne. With a shrug, he went out and returned in a few moments, carrying Matt's shirt. They, they play trick on you, he grinned. Joke. Some joke, Matt retorted. He wanted to refuse the shirt, but he couldn't afford to be proud about, any, about his only shirt. Resentfully, he pulled it over his head. Before they left, the old woman gave each of them a slab of cake, heavy with nuts and berries. Her eyes, as she looked at her grandson, were warm and bright. Matt was minding how his mother had often looked at him, pretending to be angry with him, but not able to hide that she was mighty fond of him, just the same. Suddenly, he felt a sharp stab of homesickness. Outside the cabin, Atian's dog was waiting. He limped after them to the river, and when Matt stepped into the canoe, the dog jumped in after him and settled down only a few inches from Matt's knee. He had never willingly come so close before. Never willingly. Atian noticed and commented, dog remember. Was it possible, Matt wondered? Could a dog caught in a trap, even though he snapped out in pain and fear, sense that someone was trying to help him? Could the dog remember that terrible ordeal at all? You couldn't read a, you couldn't read a dog's mind, but just possibly a dog could read a white boy's mind. <laughs> 
very slowly, Matt reached down and laid his hand on the dog's back. The dog did not stir or growl. Gently, Matt scratched behind the dog, the rag, the ragged ear. Gradually, against the bottom of the canoe, the thin tail began to thump in a contented rhythm. At the opposite bank, at the opposite bank, a Tian watched Matt climb out of the canoe, but he did not follow. Apparently, this was as far as he intended to go. As Matt hesitated, he lifted his hand. It occurred to Matt that this might be a compliment. Without saying a word, a Tian acknowledging that Matt could now find his own way through the forest. Returning his wave, Matt set out with a confidence he did not quite feel. It was growing dark. He would have to walk fast or he would not be able to mark the signs again along the trail. He was very tired. The bump on his forehead was throbbing. He was sore from head to toe and his eye was almost swollen shut. But to his surprise, deep inside he felt content. Was it because Atian's dog had finally trusted him? No, more than that it changed. He had passed some sort of test, not by any means by flying colors. He had plenty of bruises to remind him of that, but at least he had not disgraced a tin. He felt satisfied, and for the first time since his father had left him, he did not feel alone in the forest. The end of chapter 19.